session, and I'll also be uh, writing it up so I'm not being rude when I type away and <laughs> my emails. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Jerry from the uh, University of Queen Mary. It used to be Queen Mary in the West. It used to be Queen Mary in the West. Yeah, yeah. it's now yeah. Queen Mary. On its own. Uh, Professor of Renaissance Studies in the Department of English. He's going to tell you about himself, so I don't have to say very much else, but it's a great pleasure he can be here today. Thank, Thank you, you. Danny. Um, I was not, wasn't but embarrassing in saying we were doing the telly thing together. Um, but I, I, I mean, I'm really grateful to come here because, as Danny's just said, I'm not going to bang on about myself, but I think there is an interesting story to tell here about working on maps because I am not trained as a cartographer. Um, and I worked through English. I mean, I work in the Department of English and Drama at Queen Mary. I worked at places like Sussex University back in the 1980s, uh, when interdisciplinarity was still seen as something of a dirty word. And of course now interdisciplinarity is, is all the rage. And so working in the 80s in terms of talking about the interface between visual and textual studies was really what defined me. And one of the things that I kept talking about was the metaphor of mapping. So as some of you will probably know, the way in which uh, philosophical, critical, high theory in the humanities, really from the 1970s, took on the idea of space, um, the social production of space, and from that a whole raft of metaphors around mapping, cartographies of this, geographies of that, mapping of this. And that was something that, again, wasn't strictly coming out of geography and certainly wasn't coming out of cartography and the history of cartography. So people like Henri Lefebvre were writing books called The Production of Space in the early 1970s. People like Gaston Bachelard was talking about the poetics of space. And that sort of post-structuralist high theory then worked through, it seemed to me, the humanities from the 80s into the 90s. And working in a field like English studies, I found myself then doing a PhD which was looking at early modern cartography. Um, I did a book called Trading Territories, Mapping the Early Modern World in 1997. And what I found was that doing that across English and history led me to talk to people who were working in geography and the history of cartography. Now, just as English had gone through a massive revolution in the 1980s, in the 1990s, geography, as many of you will know, was going through its own upheavals and revolutions in terms of how it was understanding its own discipline. Um, and so I was finding that I was talking very, very happily to geographers and cartographers. So that's really what got me started in terms of doing this kind of work. Um, so what I want to talk about, I suppose, um, comes out of the book that I've just published, or is being published tomorrow, I think. It's called History of the World in 12 Maps. Um, you know, it's a deliberately flighty title. Um, I'm surprised people haven't cut me down more around it because the idea was to tell the story that we all know, but that to my amazement, even in sort of broadsheet reviews, people are finding quite extraordinary. Maps are partial subjective objects. They, a world map does not necessarily represent the world as it is. It represents the partial prejudice and the subjective beliefs of the people who create it. And this is news to people, and I find that quite striking. Um, and I guess that what I want to do today is to both talk at you and listen to what you have to say, because I'm very clear about the fact that although I have a long history in terms of looking at the history of map making, um, people who are working professionally in the field of cartography will have a different take on what I might want to say, which is really, I guess, how is the current shift into geospatial online applications and the development of what you're all talking about in terms of neo-cartography, how does that sit within a longer historical conspectus? So if I start to look at this moment that we're all going through now with the current map wars, with what's happening with Google, with Apple, um, that issue now, how do we see that historically? And so I'm hopefully going to tell a, a, a more engaging story than just the way in which broad, broadsheet reviews are looking at this book, to say what is happening if we try and see this right back within the context of the Greeks. If we go right back through the history of global map making to Ptolemy through the medieval early modern period and we try and see what's going on 
with geospatial applications and the shift into neocartography um, now. What I want to discuss with you, and I do because I'm really interested to see what you're making of this um, in terms of the field of cartography itself, is I want to talk about uh, you know, th this terrible buzzword, globalization. I want to look at the way in which the rhetoric of globalization um, can be discerned in what's happening with mapping. So to put it rather crudely, my question is, what happens to the globe in a period of globalization? You know, what we all talk about globalization as an economic impetus. It's about the world shrinking, it's about commodification, it's about selling goods. But again, I'm sure within our field, we're saying there is something more philosophically interesting and perhaps troubling about what's happening with globalization, um, politically and philosophically. And as I say, my question therefore is, how does cartography deal with globalization? What happens to the globe under globalization? And I want to make a distinction, I think, between globalization and globalism. So, again, many debates within the humanities at the moment are talking about what is the history of globalization? Where are we in the history of globalization? Is globalization really a very late 20th century, early 21st century phenomenon that we're only just entering? Certainly within my field of Renaissance studies, people will talk about globalization as an economic development, as starting in the late 15th or early 16th century. And people would take it even further back than that. So where are we within our moment of globalization? Um, and that seems to me a particularly pressing question when you think about the way in which geospatial applications are to some extent driving that debate. When one thinks about globalization in terms of people like Google, I'm going to be talking about Google, and thinking about the way in which mapping is reflecting a certain development of globalization. But globalism, of course, is different. You know, so what I'm going to suggest is that Ptolemy has a notion of globalism in 150 AD. That's not globalization. A notion of whole earth, think, whole earth thinking of globalism is very different perhaps to globalization as an economic and a political imperative. But I want to try and see how those two might come together. So there is quite a, a distinguished tradition of people talking about the way in which globalization has developed and the way in which it's transforming uh, contemporary perceptions of terrestrial space. Again, you start to hear my language, you know, terrestrial space, to, to try and define a little bit more clearly what we mean when we talk about globalization. So some of you will know, you'll know these names, people like David Harvey, David Harvey, the Marxist geographer, talking a lot about uh, the shrinking perception of the globe. And he talks about time, space, compression. And he talks about the way in which that, that's happened throughout the modern period. You have sociologists like Manuel Castells. Castells is talking about um, the space of flows, his interest is, is around the flows of space, space of flows that take place within what he talks about as the, the network society, the virtual network society. The French philosopher, sociologist Paul Virilio, Virilio is interested in the idea of speed. He talks about the way in which the cult of speed within contemporary technology is obliterating or uh, abolishing space, perceptions of space. So for him the argument is all about speed. And the uh, American Indian um, anthropologist Arjuna Pajurai, Pajurai talks a lot about global ethnoscapes. He's talking about the way in which not cartographic spaces or landscapes are operating, but he talks about global ethnoscapes. So the way in which different cultural traditions and different peoples and communities inhabit and move through spaces and the way that that's changing. Now, it seems to me that what a lot of those people have in common is a particular understanding about what globalization represents. And for them, globalization represents a process of deterritorialization. Deterritorialization. And that's where the constraints of geography and the way in which those constraints play on economics and on society and on culture diminish. It's a diminishing of those constraints and communities understand that diminishment and they act accordingly. To put that quite crudely in a way, 
what that arg argument about globalization and deterritorialization means is it means or it's promising the end of geography. Geography, in a sense, um, or geographical difference, might be more a better way of putting it, geographical difference ends. So in other words, of course, the economic imperative around globalization is to minimize geographical difference. Because if you minimize geographical distance in space, you optimize markets, and you can move capital and goods instantaneously across the global space, which has no geographical differentiation. Now, I'm not saying that I necessarily agree or support this, but this is the argument about globalization. Globalization is about deterritorialization, and it's almost a weird self-cancellation of cartography or geography in a weird way. So I want us to just start to think about what it means to talk about globalization within, I guess, a cartographic context. So I start, of course, with Google. Google Earth, this is the Google Earth homepage, we're all very familiar with this, here's the Earth. You know, I talk a lot about this in the book in terms of the way in which, as we know, Google Earth is both a very innovative application, but it's also a very traditional application at the same time. And I guess that's where I'm trying to put it within a wider history of cartography. Um, Google are very cross with me, of course, because I started doing work with them four or five years ago to try and save them from the sort of right-wing Daily Mail argument that Google was going to bring an end to all Western civilization. And I initially started saying, look, I want to talk to you because I find the technology incredibly innovative and very exciting, as we all do. So they, of course, said, oh, hooray, you know, you're going to be more progressive and, and give us a sort of better sort of puff. And in a way, I did, start, I did start writing about how innovative and exciting this was. It's a point for us to discuss, I guess, in terms of its cartographic innovation versus the whole questions about access um, and what it represents. Um, it's something I'd be interested to hear what you make of it. But, of course, part of my argument is that what's happened is, is a classic Marxist move within capitalism. Google starts just like a 19th century uh, industrial company. It's terribly exciting, it's terribly innovative. The people who work on it are all very progressive and very liberal. They start offering these incredibly irenic, idealized, you know, godlike images of the earth that we all play around with. And then we realize it's really about selling us stuff and advertising. And that shift, of course, that's taking place is very much what the papers are saying Google is all about. And it seems to me that the cartographic dimensions of Google really sum that, that conflict up. That Ed Parsons at Google Earth won't talk to me anymore. Because uh, he's, you know, he's a good liberal. And I think he feels really, really torn about this. I think he's genuinely a good guy. But it's that classic move. The company has now moved somewhere else. And Ed and the techies there are doing wonderful things. But the company's taking that work in a different direction. Um, you know, we, can, we can talk about this. So there's a sense we know about the innovations here. Uh, and what's, you know, it's 10 petabytes, you know, it's an extraordinary uh, piece of kit. But of course, my interest is to say, look, you know, this is quite clearly within a wider tradition. This is the 17th century, this is the Atlas Mayor, this is Dylan Blau from 1662, this is the frontispiece to his Atlas. Um, here is the wonderful, which is the Burgazal, it's, the, it's the, uh, the town hall in Amsterdam showing again uh, blau twin hemispheres, this wonderful um, image. Really rather Google-esque, you know, in the 1640s, the uh, town burghers of Amsterdam, flush with money from the Dutch East India Company, producing this kind of image, showing the twin hemispheres and the, uh, the cosmos in the center. So you've got Eastern and Western hemispheres. That you are literally walking through the space in Amsterdam. And the power and the confidence, the commercial confidence of these people in the 1650s in Amsterdam saying, we're walking on the world. We don't even need to put Amsterdam at the center of our world because we, as it were, control that commercial space. And it's very much, of course, you know, there are no boundaries here. You don't need to center your geography because you have an absolute confidence in where you stand within your cartographic space. Of course, it's the same with Google. Google doesn't valorize the west coast of America because, of course, it's a global image. And this is very much something similar that's going on here with Blau. But, of course, 
the other thing that Google is drawing on is this, the absolutely iconic 1972 Apollo Pole Earth image, the first moment where the Earth was captured from space, not by a geographer, not drawn, but by an astronaut with a, with a camera that had been thrown in the back. Wonderful story. Dennis, the late, the late and great Dennis Cosgrove, um, sorry, who was a wonderful character, wrote very wonderfully about this um, and talked about, you know, that this in a sense is the ultimate cartographic geographical image, defining image of, as it were, the whole Earth taken by an astronaut in 1972. And of course what Google's doing is explicitly drawing on that. They absolutely know the iconography of, sorry, the um, <laughs> so, you, know, you can see the way in which um, that image is quite clearly drawing on that image. And of course it's Google Earth, it's not Google World, because of course that would be far too imperialist. Um, and so there's a way in which the Google Earth homepage is explicitly drawing on the, the Irenic progressive possibilities, the environmentalism, the sort of touchy-feely touchy whole Earth image that you get in 1972. You know, James Lovelock is fascinated by this image and you know, the Gaia hypothesis is being developed around this time. And so Google exactly know what they're doing to name GE Google Earth. Um, and to draw on that kind of environment, environmental um, dimension. And with that, of course, comes their, I think, quite genuine statements about their progressive, democratic uh, support for environmental causes, for you know, opposing Appalachian Mountain uh, mining, um, the stuff that they were doing in Darfur, streaming of video stuff, all great stuff. And I think it's very, very deliberately drawing, again, on these very powerful whole earth images. But of course, as we know, this is still a modeling, and cartographically that is drawing, in terms of what Google Earth is doing, is still drawing on a certain kind of projection. What's interesting is that it draws on, of course, on the general perspective projection, Google Earth and its, and its imaging. Um, and that, of course, is a projection that goes all the way back to Ptolemy. In 150 AD, Ptolemy's geography talks about projecting using a general uh, uh, perspective projection, which is really what Google Earth is going all the way back to. So I want to really um, talk about that in a minute. My, I guess my problems, and this is one of course, an issue of, around Google, an issue that we're going to talk about, is not necessarily on the issues about privacy and copyright. They may be ones that you want to raise and they may have been part of ongoing or broader discussions that you're having within the conference. But what interests me uh, in what I'm talking about is how what Google's doing and these kind of geospatial applications are doing something very paradoxical. They're representing the waning of geographical affect that it purports to represent within this global image. So it's an idea of globalism and extensiveness, but actually it's about the waning of global affect. They're almost signaling the self-cancellation of their own image. Um, because of course what they've done is they've absorbed that very idealized image of the whole Earth into what economists have called Google-nomics. Google-nomics, of course, is the sort of very innovative way in which they basically make money. And some of you probably know the kind of stuff that they're talking about, but I was really struck by um, listening to Michael T. Jones back in 2010. And Michael T. Jones was Google's, is Google's chief technology advocate, and he was a former founder member of Keyhole. And Keyhole was a software uh, company that created the application that became Google Earth. And in April 2010, he gave a paper at the, at the Where To conference in California. It was called The New Meaning of Maps. And it's online, you've got to see this. You know, Google saying, this is the new meaning of maps. This is the great new age that we're entering. It's quite extraordinary what he says. Um, and he talked about Google Earth and Google Maps as examples of online mapping. Um, and he talked about them as, quote, a place of business, a, quote, application platform from where businesses trade what he called actionable information. 
And this seemed to me to be the logical consequence uh, of his attempt in 2006 to define the company's interests in geospatial applications. And this is what he said, and it's phenomenal stuff. He says, Google Earth connects the world with the world's information in a way that was never before possible and has excited the imagination of tens of millions of people. That's a good thing for Google. Even if our business model was to attract attention to Google and let people use Google search to pay for it, it's worked pretty well. So people who feel we went into Google Earth without the intention to make money really don't understand our business. Our business is not about the GIS components of our work. Those are the tools we use to build our business. In 2007, he said something else which I think was remarkable. He said that Google, quote, inverts the roles of web browser as application and map as content, resulting in an experience where the planet itself is the browser. So the Earth, you know, Google Earth, you know, the whole Earth, as it were, becomes the browser. That's where you start. And I think that's an extraordinary, you know, uh, you know want to talk about imperialism? That, <laughs> that's a piece of intellectual imperialism, it seems to me. Um, and so, of course, what happens is that that image of the Earth becomes the medium through which any kind of information can be accessed. Um, and when I, I did these long interviews with Ed Parsons a few years ago for the book, and I have got Ed saying, for us, Google Earth and Google Maps are the visual representation of geography. But geography is buried in almost everything we do, because almost all information has some geographical context to it. And at that time, about two and a half years ago, he estimated that over 30% of all Google searches have explicit geographical elements. So, of course, what it's now doing, as we know, is it's organizing information geographically as well as alphabetically and numerically. So, for them, the world is becoming an enormous web browser, um, the ultimate homepage from which to find anything. Um, now, in that process, it seems to me that what happens is that the geographical dimension of the globe, for us as cartographers, seems to recede from view. So if you look at the way in which Google's now working, the merging of its Earth and Maps applications leads to a rather prosaic use of, of place pages. And of course, this is one of the things that people are now getting very worried about, that the cartographic dimension of Google that's, prob that's problematic is it's no longer just a portal. So all the online entrepreneurs who I talked to said, our concern is that the place pages that Amazon are now creating, are it's them creating their own content. We've never seen Google do this before. They've basically just been used as a portal. We get in and we search, but now they are authoring their own content. So those place pages are written by Google, and that's what the industry finds really troubling. That, that literal mapping between the place page map and the text is something that you're not in control of, Google is, and that that's very disquieting for people. And they just, they do see that as a form of monopolization. So, now what interests me, just to then go back, and let's look at a bit of history, because some of the maps. It's a very old map. The Hereford Map of Monday, from 1300. Now, what I want to think about is the way that <laughs> I'm going to actually suggest that I think the Hereford Map of Monday is doing something quite similar to Google Earth. <laughs> because I do think that what it's doing is it's another image of geographical self cancellation. This is an image of the medieval Christian world, which is about a world which you're going to supersede, which is a world which is passing, that you move beyond the earthly terrestrial world and you rise up at the top, um, as I'm sure many of you know this image, um, here's east at the top, here's um, the British Isles down here, here's Africa and all the tiresome monstrous races that people always want to know about. But of course what interests me is that what you have up here is Christ in his majesty, and you have angels here rising up to the apex. And it's about the fact that outside the frame of the map, you're leaving this earthly world, the contentus mundi tradition, you know, which says the earth that we live in is basically just a, is a husk, is a sort of poor shell, and everything is about transcending it and getting to the afterlife. And so what you get is this sort of apocalyptic, eschatological world, which is saying the earthly realm 
has to go before you get to where you really want to be. Now, weirdly, I find that has an odd resonance with the way in which globalization is similarly saying the world, the globe that we inhabit is really a problem for us. You know, what economic globalization wants is to reduce that image of the globe to nothing more than a logo. It wants to abolish distance, abolish geographical difference, and get beyond it to some pure, unfettered notion of economic exchange. That, and it's a fantasy. Okay, I'm, I'm not I don't want to say I'm mean, obviously not supporting it because I'm a right or lefty, but I also want to say that there's a real fantasy there in terms of what globalization seems to be promising. But weirdly, it has this strange eschatology, rather like the Hereford Map Mundi, because it's about this abolition of time and space. So I'm just sort of curious about, I guess I, what I'm worrying about over this talk is how might we think about globalism and globalization throughout history. We see it as something so new, but cartographically, there are these relentless moves, not even as far back as Hereford in 1300, but as far back as the Greeks. This, of course, is Ptolemy, 150 AD. This is the first projection from Ptolemy's geography, later Byzantine Greek copy, because as we know, Ptolemy's geography never seems to have contained maps, so we get over a thousand years before we get Byzantine manuscripts of, of Ptolemy's geography, which then have maps, so we don't even know if Ptolemy authorised or drew any world maps. But this is a late 12th, early 13th century Greek map of the acumeny of Ptolemy's world picture, drawn on his first projection as outlined in the geography. And it seems to me, of course, this is a certain version of a movement towards the whole Earth. Ptolemy talks about the notion of the Earth as a globe, but what he's interested in, as he says, is the inhabited Earth, the ecumeny. So, of course, focused on the Mediterranean world, going down as far as not really sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the left, um, a very hazy Southeast Asia, and going up as far as the British Isles, as you can see there. So that's, as it were, um, the world picture, according to Ptolemy in the Hellenic world. And then, of course, what you get is in Ptolemy, you know, Ptolemy very clear, and, and now we're, you know, we know we know this in terms of our cartographic history, but Ptolemy is very, very clear that any projection, of course, has to be partial. So he says, here is the first projection, and you can see the way in which it operates really on this sort of fan shape, the first projection, then we know the second projection which he says, well, I prefer a bit, but it's still quite tough to draw. This is a much later version. This is the 1482 Ulm edition. And you can see the difference between the two projections. This one, obviously, slightly more complex in terms of its construction. But Ptolemy says, you can use either. He says, I'm very clear about this. You cannot plot the globe onto a plane surface. So here are the two versions that I'm offering you. And I'd say, you know, both are, as it were, global um, images. So what I'm struck by is somebody who works in the, in the early modern, which was called the Renaissance, or the early modern period, so circa 1400 to 1600, is of course the way in which Ptolemy works through and influences that early moment of discovery in the 15th century. So traditionally what historians of cartography have talked about is that geography's Ptolemy is somehow at odds with what the Portuguese and the Spanish start doing in the late 15th century. Because people say, well, this is no good if you're basically um, sailing east or west of this world picture, because you know there there are no Americas. Um, basically, the Indian Ocean is just a lake, um, and the circumference of the Earth is underestimated by about 18%, um, or about 10,000 kilometres. But that's not really what happens, because this again, this sort of global image that Ptolemy offers, and a certain mathematical um, I call it digital, the way in which Ptolemy is really offering a kind of digital basis upon which to project the Earth. Because don't forget, the original text of geography does not have maps. It simply has a bunch of discrete numbers and letters. Therefore, I would define it as being rudimentary, a form of digital analysis. This is analog. Ptolemy is digital, in a way. And that's why Ptolemy survives so long. So from the 15th century, the recovery of Ptolemy leads 
Spanish, Portuguese, European cartographers to say, as it were, this world picture is one that we can work with quite well. So it gives, as it were, a geographical template upon which to work. And as we know, that template changes very radically. But that's why, you know, between, you know, from 1400 when the text is first recovered to like the late 16th century, Mercator is still drawing Ptolemy's geography in the late 16th century. And the reason for that is because it's a template that can be absolutely changed. It bears no relationship in terms of what Mercator is doing in the late 16th century to this. But that template, that global template, um, is very, very powerful. I've shown you so. What's interesting is the way in which, therefore, Ptolemy's global image has an impact around its error. The fact that it's in error, of course, leads to quite interesting conclusions. This is Martin Behaim's 1492 uh, first terrestrial globe, first surviving terrestrial globe that we have in 1492. I think this is quite extraordinary. We have no surviving terrestrial globes. We have celestial globes, but this is the first surviving one, 1492. Martin Behaim and Behaim is uh, a German merchant who claims that he travels around the west coast of Africa um, on the Portuguese possessions, which you can probably see here. So what I'm just pointing out to you is, interestingly, still a very Ptolemaic image of West uh, Europe, west coast of Africa. But then we now do seem to have a circumnavigable um, southern Africa, because it's 1492, it's post-Diaz, it's just pre-Dagana. Uh, and you have an Indian Ocean which seems to be opened up. Um, if we span it round, we see that rather sadly, in terms of his time in 1492, so early 1492, not late 1492, because America is on it. It's a terrible timing. So we don't have the results of Columbus's discovery. But what's interesting is that on the Haynes globe, the space between the west coast of Portugal and the east coast of China, traveling west via the Atlantic, is just 130 degrees. The actual distance, of course, is nearly double that, 230 degrees. Now, that error will be very, very significant, that it's an enduring error that comes from Ptolemy in terms of kick-starting another kind of global moment of discovery, which is about Columbus and Magellan going west to get to the east, based upon that crucial cartographic error of the 130 degrees going west to get to China rather than 230 degrees. And when you factor that in to Columbus and Magellan's decision to go west and east, you can understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, based on an error which comes from Ptolemy. Um, now, then, of course, we get this fabulous map, which is the Martin Volsimula 1507 map. Um, which is the first map to show America. You can see America is labeled down here, uh, around there. Um, yeah, the US Library of Congress paid $10 million for it um, a few years back because they see it as the birth certificate of America. It's incredibly important. You can see at the top, you've got Vespucci and Ptolemy literally facing off. This is about the discoveries of America, America being named after America's Vespucci. And so it's again a way in which a new world is being disclosed. And you can see the two eastern and western hemispheres, their relative areas of interest. Um, and it's an extraordinary map because what you can see if you look at that shape, this sort of bulb shape, it's basically a modified version of Ptolemy's second projection. Keep that in your head. second projection, which is precisely because what Ptolemy said is that second projection is quite good if you want to basically get a global perspective on the Earth. But you'll see this is still not a 360 degree map, actually. What Voltimuller has done is basically distorted and warped a map. You look at the way in which the Cape of Good Hope operates down here, literally has broken the frame. And these massive distortions that you're getting up here, everybody focuses on the west coast distortion, 
but actually look at Japan up there. And that is because of that stretch in the Volsi Muller's attempt still not to give us a 360 view of the globe. So it's still, in my argument, not a world map. It is global, but it's not as it were a world map. And it's using Ptolemy really like pushing the constraints of Ptolemy's cartographic projection um, as far as it will go. Um, and that seems to me an extraordinary moment in 1507 with Volsi Muller doing that. Um, this is my favourite map ever in the entire world. Um, and if you want a map, as it were, that I think offers the first real global moment, uh, a moment of globalism, which is also interestingly tied to globalization, then I'm putting it here. This is Diego Rivera's 1529 world map. You can see 1529 up there. Um, and this is his map, which is showing the post-Magellan moment of the conflict over possession of the Moluccas. So sorry, uh, people will know this, because I've been doing this for 20 years, I just think this is the most extraordinary map, which basically puts the Moluccas both here in the west and again here in the east, so it reproduces, it replays where the Moluccas sit in the east and western hemispheres. And I don't know if some of you, some of you may not know this, but basically this map is being used. Ribeiro was a Portuguese map maker who, when Magellan went off on his circumnavigation of the globe 1519 to 1522, Ribeiro switched sides because Ribeiro, like Magellan, believed that you could sail west, again based on Ptolemy and Bahame's mistaken calculations. He thought you could sail west to get to the east, and that that would be a shorter route. And just look at that map. I mean, what always fascinates me is in terms of the maps that I'm just showing you, look at the extension of the Pacific. We've never seen that before. Look at the Volsi Muller map, which just showed the Pacific. But look at that. But this Ptolemaic world, which is you know pretty much as we'd expect to see it from Ptolemy. But that is an extraordinary recentering, it seems to me, of a global image. And what Riviera does is that once Magellan comes back, and Magellan doesn't come back because he's killed in the Philippines. Um, but in 1522, when the flotilla comes back to Spain, the Spanish say, right, we know that the Treaty of Tordesillas runs down there on a, on a flat map, but now where does that line go if you have a globe? Where does it go in the Eastern Hemisphere? And so the reason that the map is drawn like this is that Riviera is trying to say everything to the west here is Spanish, and everything to the east of that line here um, is Portuguese. So where does the line fall? And surprise, surprise, because Riviera is a very shrewd cartographer who knows you're never going to work out longitude for another two or three hundred years because you end up with good timepieces. He rather wonderfully puts it seven and a half degrees, he puts the Moluccas there, seven and a half degrees within the Spanish half of the globe. So it's, it becomes this fabulous map which is used around, and that's why I call, I call the book Trading Territories, it's about the way in which the map becomes this enduring document used in the political settlement of these economic conflicts between Spain and Portugal. And just like the sort of current fantasies around globalisation, this is of course a fantasy that says Portugal and Spain can split the earth in the middle there, and everything to the west is Spanish and everything to the east is Portuguese. It's an absolute fantasy. But this moment, 1529, seven years after Magellan comes back, I think it's cartographically such an important moment around globalism and globalization, because of course that's what Magellan's voyage is about. It's an economic voyage about capturing and monopolizing a certain trade, in this case in spices. And that hopefully makes my example very clear. This is from Holbein's painting, The Ambassadors, 1533, four years after Ribeiro's map that we've just seen. And so that line there, which you can actually see, says the line between Castile and Portugal, that's the Treaty of Tordesillas line established in 1494. And that's, so that's the line there, okay? So how does it look on a globe? Well, I love what, I love what Holbein's done here. Look what he's done. There's the line in red. Oh, 
It's in darkness. And I think that Holbein is deliberately alluding to that splitting of the globe at this period, just in the late 1520s to 1530s. Now this globe suddenly is part of a massive explosion that you get in terms of map making. Um, 1492 you have the Haynes globe. You don't get any of the globes for about another 20 years. As soon as this map is made, and when news of Magellan's circumnavigation of a globe hits Europe, inundated with global images. Suddenly, global, you know, terrestrial map making goes mad, absolutely explodes. Um, Peter van der Hoff has written about this um, in terms of the other language maps. And this is what's really interesting because the Voltsimula map, 1507 Voltsimula map, comes with globe goals. So Voltsimula says, well, look, you know, here's the world map, you like a big world map, but if not, you can have a kit here of globe goals that you can cut up and use to make your own little globe. So there's a way in which you know, this image is a global image, and it's a truly global image because you can buy that map and then you can also get your globe goals with it to make a terrestrial globe. And these are just examples, again, from the same period of the way in which the globe is being represented as split between um, a Western Spanish hemisphere and an Eastern Portuguese hemisphere. And there you go, there are the, the Spice Islands, the Mocos, on Rivera's, Rivera's maps. I just wanted to show you that. Now, now I can take you forward, of course, and we know this, this debate between that image, which we all know, which is the 1569 Mercator projection, that image, Peter's projection, and you know, the way in which just 40 years later, Mercator, after what I'm describing, this extraordinary moment of globalization in the 1520s after Magellan, Magellan's voyage, and the cartographic initiatives that come with that, 40 years later, it seems to be no surprise that Mercator delivers this projection and how enduringly powerful it is. And then, of course, we all know the conflict. We'll get Danny going on. Um, but we know the conflict then between uh, Peter's and the argument about the Eurocentrism and the Cater's. And it seems to me that all that dispute, and I've written about it in the book, all that dispute crystallized, and I'm sure Danny does have a view on this, that all it crystallized was you know, that conflict within the field of cartography and geography in the 70s about professionalization versus politicization. And it seems to me that Peter's got various things wrong, but the main thing he got wrong was to simply not state outright that any global projection is obviously partial and subject to distortion. Everything else he said, I think, you know, that he certainly wrote, it seemed to me fair enough. But he simply tried to say his map was more accurate. You know, and so for me that, that crystallizes a certain dispute that we're still working through, I think, in terms of uh, map making and cartography between the dispute there in terms of what Peters is saying. Um, I, yeah, so what I'm doing, because I'm, I'm just going to stop in a minute, because I just want to know what you make of this. What strikes me as really interesting is that we've, we've gone somewhere else today, that these images that I've been showing you are very much connected to arguments about globalism, whole earth, cartographic mappings um, of the world. They are connected to a form of globalization, certainly from the early 16th century, it seems to me, because that's part of the story that I want to tell you. Where we are now, and this is where I want to ask you what you think, seems to me very, very different than what the, as I understand it, the disputes about neo-cartography uh, are leading to. A huge problems that with a lot of the maps I've been showing you, it's very much about private initiatives, and it's not about cartographers and geographers being enshrined in state legislation, which is something that we are now more familiar with, certainly since the 18th century. Um, when you look at the Cassini surveys, and you look at what the Ordnance Survey uh, has done here in the UK, we are now clearly in a different place, where the notion of professional geographical and cartographic involvement in cutting edge online cartography um, has changed. Um, it's really changed and I'm just curious about what we think about that 
and what we do with that, that we are basically, it seems to me, no longer involved in the production of this kind of imagery. We all may be working in different ways on digital cartography, but it seems to me we're not here. And I remember being stunned when I talked to Ed Parsons and saying, well, people in geography departments and people working in cartography must be all over you to do research projects. And he said, no, no. And I was absolutely shocked. And I'm sure you'll say that's as much them as it is us, as it were. But I was quite struck by that. So I guess the question is, you know, what do we think of that? Are we happy with this situation? Because the story, I think, that I've told you um, takes us into quite difficult questions um, about what we think about the current state of the map and where cartographers sit in it. But that's where I end, and I really want uh, you to come in. So let's just do that. Great. Thank you. interesting where you've chosen to end your story because I, in some ways what you've described is a sort of brief history of transcendental thinking through maps. So you've got the map in Monday which has a transcendental heaven on the east where everyone's facing and then you've got uh, a transcendental map where you progressively track modern capitalism where you're saying okay this is where the cash is yeah. let's organise our map related to that. But of course we've moved beyond those um, Big scale systems now, where everyone is a transcendental. So, like um, most people now, many people within this brilliant part of the world where we're all really rich and um, not subject to frequent warfare, we've all got like um, smartphones. We no longer really have hard cartography. We're carrying around cartography with us all the time, just always being geotagged. And so, in many ways, the mapping we see here has always been replaced with like a sort of a um, constant flow of map. Sort of almost like a so they, they here we've got the standard map territory divide yeah. but when you carry around your map you're effectively continuously QAing the map you're carrying sort of like uh, meshing this representation of the lived experience well, and why do you see that going in terms of those those questions or those issues and, you know about authority you know the way that you know, uh, you know people talk about you know, well the map is then mapping you mm -hmm. are you sort of seeing that as a more interestingly open-ended way in which those questions of authority are bouncing back and forth between you and the creator of the map. I don't see, I see that the creator of the map will become a gradually more diffuse process where with things like OpenStreetMap there will be more and more uh, people authoring their own data mm -hmm. and then the actual knowledge becomes more of a, uh, a service rather than a centralised resource. Yeah. So it's sort of flux. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it? Because I, 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 I sort of worry I'm kicking Google a bit too hard when I was doing this the other day on the radio. And, and it was fair enough, it's, the, it's what one does with these kind of commercial books. But I think what you're saying is quite right. And I was noticing that well, I finished the book 12, 14 months ago, and I ended up being, you know, almost hysterical in prose about where Google were. What we've seen in the last four weeks is that with the Apple challenge to what, say, Google represents, people are now writing stuff in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the tech paper saying, will Google be here in two years' time? And that's the sense, it seems to me, of how quick this is moving. So I don't think there are any answers. I mean, I was thinking about doing this. I don't think you can end up standing up, giving this kind of keynote lecture and saying, this is how it is. It's just you can't do it. You just can't do it. I think we're in such flux around this work. Um, and I was the first to think as soon as I'd finished that stuff on Google, it was already outdated. Absolutely. But I think it's interesting what you're saying. I think that's, and, and yeah, because I mean, I think that that is part of my argument that the way in which it's moved as a capitalist organisation is so classic. You know, I remember I worked with Amazon when it was a startup in the UK, and we started, and I used to do reviewing for them, and we get people like Edward Said on the homepage back in 1998, and now they sell washing machines, you know? And that was always how it was going to move, and it seems to me that that's very much how the industry has moved in that way, but yeah, thanks. Can I pick up on something you said about speed? I think I heard you right, saying that at some point speed diminishes space. I, I would perhaps put a counter view that um, one of the aspects of neo-cartography is I can have a small amount of skills, get a large amount of data, and produce a map myself, for myself quite quickly. Yeah. I, I could argue that instant maps actually make you understand space rather than diminish space. Is that something that's 
No, well, that's interesting because you know Virilio was really starting. You know, there's a whole real. I, it just kills me when I stand up and I go to an academic conference and people say the spatial turn has happened in the humanities, and I think it happened 50 years ago, sweetheart. Yeah. And so Virilio was saying this in the 1970s, but what you just described is again where the technology has caught up with that. So Virilio was just being very worried about the way in which, you know, his great thing is airports. He says you move through airports, and he says it's like a form of teleportation and a notion of travail of travelling and the, the problems of travel are diminished completely. That's why Baudrillard you know, says the first Gulf War never happens, because it's a complete abolition of any sense of the reality out there. It's all completely mediated. And really it just says that that's what you know, the airport lounge is really about. You just teleport it from one place to the other. So the speed of movement abolishes distance. But then what you're seeing is, of course, that what the technology has done is flip that over and then, as it were, opened up the space in a different way. So I'd agree with that, just say, yeah, of course, 30 years on, that model looks very outdated. But it's just that that's, that kick-started a lot of us, I think, in the humanities. Because I don't want to say you, <laughs> but a group of people working in cartography, your, your area was, in a sense, intellectually, totally hijacked <laughs> by other areas of the humanities from the 80s onwards. And that's why I like doing this, because of course you can only do so much in these chats, but it seems to me that you have to have some dialogue, and that hasn't been happening. How many of you really talk to people in history? How many of you talk to people in English studies? We're all merrily banging on about maps. You know? They're not making them, they're not working them, working with them at the level that you are. They're all going on about them. I'm in the button. Um, I'm interested in, in how insightful it's possible to be in the moment. So that, that uh, picture of the ambassadors was full of all kinds of, of little tricks and things and had the first card to in. Now that could have been him being very clever or it could have just been a shadow. Um, if you look at Peter's now, from my point of view, look at the Peter's projection now, um, it was a German pacifist producing a map who was living in the 1970s and 80s on where we were planning to hold a war. And cartography at the time was dominated by Americans, many of whom had actually worked in the CIA. Uh, but I don't see, that's my view, I'm not going to accept you to agree with it. Um, but I don't, I don't find anybody writing about the Peter's projection at the time with that kind of view. So what I'm trying to say is, is there, is there evidence of people being heavily insightful within a few years? of things in the past, that means that there is at least a chance of getting it right about Google now. Mm. Well, if there isn't, you've got no chance. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yes and no. I mean, what I do in the book is say the whole argument about Mercator generally is wrong, because I think, again, it's a similar, I think the weirdness is how similar Mercator and Peters are. They're both German-speaking people who come from a period of cataclysmic political um, uh, upheaval, warfare, you know, Mercator living through a period of uh, reformation, the man is in prison for heresy. And I think that what I think that what the what the projection is really about is it's a purely back to the first question, the great question about um, transcendence. I think that Mercator Mercator is producing a map which is really about trying to transcend um, political strife and turmoil. The projection is to some extent uh, is a sort of side, it's not a side issue, it drives it, but I think we should look at that in terms of theology, not in terms of Eurocentrism. I think if you read all the apparatus, because of course nobody does it, nobody reads the Latin of Mercator, where he's basically producing a neo-Stoic argument about the fact the world around him is being destroyed and Europe is pulling itself to pieces. And what we need is a sort of stoic or transcendent or Dennis Cosgrove-esque argument. Dennis Cosgrove got me here, that's why I always get very tearful about Dennis, because he worked, he wrote wonderfully about when we were all saying how pragmatic map makers were at this point in the 16th century. Good old Dennis is a good old Jesuit trained uh, scouts boy, would say there is a there is a belief in the irenic transcendent neoplatonic dimension to the vertical rising up, looking down on the earth transcending petty conflicts, and that that's what Mercator is doing. And it seems to me that I think you're right, that if we then look within that kind of dimension, Peters is doing something very similar. You know, the equal area map is about, as you say, is about equality. 
and the political dimension in terms of the way in which the professionalization of cartography just poured a torrent of abuse on him. But at the same time, Robinson was saying, well, this map's crap, because it was outselling his own. You know, the vested interests that were going on there were incredibly complicated. Um, and I still think we're working through the consequences of that. But the, the, that kind of question about to what extent one can see what's happening, I think is a, is a, is a really good one. It's a really good one. The image you were showing before of the world was actually a photograph or a satellite yeah. image. Aren't we moving toward a situation where, with photography and satellite images, we can have a map of the world which is the same size as the world yeah. and the same resolution yeah. as what we see? Yeah, but then of course it's all that. That's where I come in as somebody who works on literature. That you know, there's a whole long, rich tradition about. What's the point of having a one-to-one -one scale map? You know, as Borges says, you know, the map then just ends up being sort of lost in the desert and ripped to shreds. But of course, that's what Google will say. That's their, their wonderful conceit that they believe, of course, and they can make a one-to-one -one scale map, as it were, of the world. And what they're after, again, is that they want to move beyond the abstraction, of course, that we all work with as cartographers. So that's why they will resolutely refuse to talk about map, and they will talk about geospatial application because they think that what they're engineering is something that's a weird hybrid that of course transcends the notion of the map. That it's both a spatial object but it's also a temporal object because of course you can stream stuff, you can change the whole experience of it and that's what they think that they're trying to do, something slightly different. So yeah, absolutely. I mean my problem is, is it, 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 with it is again that I think that what that is, is window dressing. I think Google Earth is a very, very expensive piece of window dressing they put up, if you look at Google Maps, it's unbelievably prosaic, you know, it's embarrassingly poor, and that's of course just because all they want is a place pitch. They send you here to get very excited, but you know, this is real, this is Tobler's first law of geography, you know, what they're interested in is drawing you in to anything, everything is connected, but what's really close to you is more important than things that are far away from you. And that's my other concern about what this kind of, the rhetoric of this kind of geospatial image it's unbelievably parochial. It's not about distance and travel. It's not about the globe as we experience it. It's very parochial. It's about finding the Chinese restaurant that's very near to you. It's not about going to Southeast Asia. It's about you go on here, you find where you live, you feel comforted, and then you go and buy the Chinese takeaway. So it's that version of globalization, which is not about the far away, it's the near at hand. Um, very last question. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, a slight change in um, context, but um, there's a nice um, exhibition at the, I think it's the Saatchi Gallery, which I went to recently. And there's a room there, and I'm afraid I've forgotten the um, artist's name, or I'm not sure what you would type of the, the person. But um, it shows straight view, um, sorry, street view um, images from all around the world. This person sort of started looking at the images sort of from when they were first put up. And he has gone through and collected images of um, street accidents and uh, uh, street ladies sort of fly in their trade in various corners. But it's sort of interesting how that's sort of able to tell the stories of people at the street level as against sort of this, um, you know, allocentric godlike view from the, from the outside. And so I really enjoyed that exhibition, which I know wants to look at. But it's at the Saatchi Gallery? I think I recall it was at the Saatchi Gallery, yeah, in one of the rooms there. Well, as you know, I mean, just, you know the, the way in which the artists, of course, are moving into this territory is fascinating, the way in which they're playing. And again, that seems to me to say something when the artist gets into something which has become, as it were, so politicised, which is what seems to have really happen. When you get Grace and Perry making tapestry maps, you know something weird's going on. Which is a brilliant link. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank Jerry again. Thank you very much.